My sobriety date is February 27th, excuse me, 1987. And my home group is the Blaine International Group of Alcoholics Anonymous. Thank you. And, um, you know, Blaine is like the last stop on I-5 if you're ever <laughs> heading north. Uh, so stop and visit us. We're there every Tuesday and Friday night is at 7.30. And we have an have 11 a.m. meeting on uh, Saturday morning and a 4 o'clock women's meeting on Monday afternoons. And we have a few others online as well. But we're, we've started doing live meetings again. So um, since I confused, since I was confused by... Um, I'm just going to do a little bit of what it was like, what happened, what's like now, because I think that's kind of what I would do. That is what I do when I'm uh, talking with the newcomer. Um, I grew up on a farm in southeastern Washington, and um, I come by my disease naturally. I... Um, was not an easy kid to raise, you know. I, uh, when I was three, and I only know that I was three, I, d I don't really, I'm not a person who has, I used to say that I didn't have any childhood memories, but all the memories, I didn't have very many, but all the ones I had were bad. <coughs> I realize now that I actually do have some good ones, and I have this memory, which is exactly good. The only reason I know that I was three is because it might have, the older of my two younger brothers was born in 1954, when I was three, and he, my mom had him in one of those little cradle gizmos, and she took a strawberry picking. <clears throat> and, you know, it was a gorgeous sunny day in eastern Washington. It was warm. It must have been June, and um, the strawberry fields were beautiful, you know, straight green rows, and they had this beautiful yellow straw for you to, so that when you're on your knees picking strawberries, you don't get dirty. And my mom had told me, don't eat any strawberries until we pay for them. You know, and I kind of understood the concept, you know, I kind of understood it, but you know, they were so beautiful <laughs> and they smelled so good. So when my mom would go check on my little brother, I would have these strawberries, you know, and, um, that night at home, I got really sick. I had like, uh, I had hives and my eyes swelled shut and I was sneezing and coughing and choking and I had um, hives and a fever and they figured out I was having an allergic reaction to strawberries. So I didn't get to eat any more strawberries that summer. But over the winter, we discovered that I could eat cooked strawberries, like jam and jelly, to uh -huh. make me sick. So the next summer, she takes the strawberry picking again and um, she gives me the same lecture and, you know, don't eat them until we paid for them. And you probably shouldn't eat any anyway. But again, they were so beautiful. And they <laughs> smelled so good. And my little four-year-old now, alcoholic brain, said, this time it'll be different. <laughs> and that is how I lived my life. I have never been able to follow directions. And I always, you know, I had that thing that we refer to as terminal uniqueness. You know, I'm so special, you know. Surely the directions don't belong to me or apply to me. I mean, it's like I've always really been able to relate to the ch the story about the hitchhiker in the big book because I got or the jaywalker in the big book because I got a ticket for jaywalking. I just told Eileen the story this afternoon. I didn't tell her the whole story, but I mean, really, you know, I just didn't have time to go to the stoplight. You know? <laughs> so special. So, um, I, in that home that I grew up in, it was a little, it was um, loud, and I developed my mind reading skills, you know, to listen at the door and <coughs> is it safe to go in, Can, is it, do I dare be hungry, or what do I have to do? So I learned as a child that thing about I'll be anything you want me to be, just tell me what it is, to be safe. It was a survival skill as a kid. And then as I got older and got into high school, and um, things started getting worse at home, and uh, I started running away. And um, 
I was looking for for solutions to what what I perceived as unmanageable problems. You know how what um, I find sometimes when I'm talking to someone that's new, they share a problem that is so bad, and you know you kind of talk them off a ledge and talk them through the acceptance thing, and you know you're fine right now. Nothing's you know no, nobody's hurting you. You're not nobody's going to kill you today, and and so. They sort of see that and then they have another one, you know, but what about this? You know, we got to move and we can't find a place to move, you know, just problems and problems and problems. And that's the way I was, you know, in the, in the big book, in the third step, it talks about if only, if only, if only. And I still know today that when I hear my brain going, if only, or when then, then I'm in trouble and I need to get back there to 61 to 63. And remember, you know what I'm doing. But, um, anyways, I, I, uh, you can imagine that the first time my original sponsor tried to explain the allergy and the obsession to me, I'm like, but I outgrew strawberries. Don't you think I can outgrow this? You know? <laughs> and uh, no, no was the answer. You don't get to outgrow alcoholism. And I am. Oh, Gosh, I'm helping. I'm trying to help a girl right now that just, she just, you know, she, she just doesn't, she doesn't think she needs to go to AA. And um, boy, it's, uh, it's a test. I wish I could have brought her. She never would have come, but I mean, <laughs> yeah, she wouldn't. Have. But anyways, um, I've invited her to lots of meetings and uh, yeah. So anyways, I'm, uh, my life, you know, there's a line in Bill's story that says gradually things got worse and gradually things got worse in my life. Um, I kept running away and eventually I, you know, I did graduate from high school and I ran off to the University of Washington and oh my gosh, that was really a lot of fun. I uh, lived on Greek Row and um, partied a lot and didn't manage to get to class very much. Uh, just barely slid by for a while and then I had to make a decision that would have been like a commitment and I just couldn't do it so I was just going to take the quarter off and I never went back and um, one summer in the late 80s no late 70s excuse me um, no early 70s it doesn't matter I went to school. I went to school in the six. I'm sorry. I really. I'm very tired today. I didn't sleep well last night, and then, like I said, I got that goofy little thing with the phone. Oh my goodness, having a hard time concentrating. Usually, I can tell my story in a linear manner, but um, as another example of my poor decision making, uh, there was a beautiful sunny day. It was a Friday afternoon. I had, I was living in Fremont by that time. I'd been, I, you know, lived in the U District several places. And then I, I was living in Fremont working on uh, South Lake Union. And one day I took my check, my paycheck on Friday to my bank in the University District. I still had the bank account in the U District. And there were these guys hitchhiking right by the Blue Moon Tavern on 45th. <laughs> you know, there's a liquor store next to the Blue Moon. These guys were hitchhiking because they had only gotten out of prison six days earlier. <laughs> and I picked him up and married one of them. Um, not that day, but you, know, you get the idea about my thought processes and my, my decision making. I was, uh, what were we reading? We we're reading the ninth step and the word prudence is in there. And um, I looked it up just for sport and um, <laughs> You know, a person sort of knows that it's like about like being reasonable or cautious, you know. I didn't have any of that, none of that. I was sure that I would be fine, always. Well, he was a heroin addict, and so that didn't go well. Um, but I'm very stubborn. This is my, you know, pre-Alanon era. And uh, I was going to fix him. I was sure that I could fix him. And compared to him, I looked good, right? <laughs> I just had a little drinking problem, you know? You know, a few of those little condiments, but nothing as serious as his. And uh, 
Um, you know, one of the ways that I tried to fix it was that I decided that we'd be okay if we had a child, mm -hmm. and um, that that's what we needed for you know to, to recommit and re-strengthen our bond and blah blah blah. And that was just a horrible thing to do to an infant. I um, didn't have the words then, but today I recognize that I took that child hostage, really. And um, well, yeah. Anyways, the the, the marriage. Uh, dissolved after five years, and then I got really crazy. Sound familiar? You know, it's like, who knew that he was the guardrail? You know, not me. And um, so then the, the poor kid became the guardrail. I mean, he was the reason that I ever made it home, ever. And um, yeah, it just it just got worse and worse. And there were. Um, there was a stretch of my life in there that I said that, the, and it's true that the life expectancy of all my relationships was about two years. And um, before I go any farther, I might forget to say that today I've been loving and faithful to the same man for 37 years. So there are changes, things do get better. But um, there was a stretch of time in there where, you know, I thought he could fix me. You know, my sponsor says money, men, and mansions. You know, those are the things that we're always looking for to solve our problems. We don't realize we have inside problems. And um, there was a day that uh, there was this guy that lived in Snohomish. I was living in Snohomish then, and he was this, he was little and skinny and ugly. And when I first met him, like ten years earlier, he was not nearly cool enough for me. But now he was driving a Rolls Royce, and that got my attention. And that guy was a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. He had almost a year at that time. And I'll be anything you want me to be. Just tell me what it is. And so eventually, um, I went to a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous with that guy. And he let me drive the Rolls Royce, you know? sort of my own personal version of a court card. I thought that his checkbook would solve all my problems. They didn't, he didn't. <laughs> but you know what, I stayed. Not, not, it wasn't smooth, it's not gonna, it's not gonna smooth path. Uh, I, my first sobriety date was June, 1986, but, but the, the real one is February 27th, 1987. And I try to remember that when I'm, when I'm working with new people talking to younger people. You know, I've heard it said, I did all my slips before I ever got to AA, you know, because I tried, again, everything that it talks about on page 33 in, in chapter three about switching from scotch to brandy or scotch to randy, you know, <laughs> depending on what day it is. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, taking a trip, not taking a trip. I used to go home and visit my parents in Eastern Washington. They could never understand why I was always sick when I came home to visit. You know? But I told myself that I wasn't an alcoholic because I didn't have, because I hadn't drank in a couple weeks, you know. You know how we do. I'm sure that um, I was going to, I was going to be okay. I was always sure it was going to be okay. But um, what happened to me that summer when I finally went to Alcoholics Anonymous was that a woman named Maria, who knew that the Rolls Royce was probably not gonna, I probably wasn't gonna stay sober just based on that. And she got my phone number. And Maria called me almost every night that first summer in 1986. And mm -hmm. you know, she'd call and say, you wanna go to a meeting? And I'm like, Hi, Maria, don't you have any friends? You know, <laughs> yeah, don't you have anything else to do? And um, today I know that I have a life because of AA. AA has given me a life. It isn't my whole life, but it has taught me how to have a life. And she had a life. She just loved to help new people. And Maria lived in Everett and I lived in Snohomish and she used to drive, she would never say, you know, I would say sometimes, well, I'll meet you there. You know, like when I sobered up in 87, um, all the meetings in Snohomish County were at eight o'clock. So like all a newcomer ever had to remember was where they were, like Marysville, Warm Beach, Lake Stevens, Snohomish, you know, what, whatever. They were all at eight o'clock. So that's all you had to remember was just what night of the week you were going where. 
and it was so much easier, <laughs> but she, she never trusted me. She knew that you don't trust a newcomer to meet you at the meeting. Mm -hmm. you, she would come and pick me up and she lived in Everett and I lived in Snohomish and she would pick me up. She would drive from Everett to Snohomish and she would take me to Marysville or Woodenville or Monroe and into 18th and Baker and Everett and also where the Alano Club is there, <laughs> you know, and we'd go to the, um, what's the blah, 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 Lynn Fellowship in, you know, we just, we just went everywhere. And I thought that, you know, I mean, I still had a house, a kid and a job and a car when I came in here. I mean, I just barely had all those things. I just was barely keeping the plate spinning. But I thought I had a better car than she did. And I said, mean, why don't you let me drive? And she's like, Linda, I believe that as long as I keep putting drugs in my car, God will make sure I always have a car. And I have uh, benefited from having heard that. I, uh, there was a stretch of time after I moved up to Blaine, there was this old guy that had sobered up in 1952 who didn't drive at night. And... I would drive him to meetings. You know, it's like, I wouldn't drive myself to a meeting, you know, but I got to take Jim. The meeting needs Jim. I don't want him to miss the meeting. I don't want the meeting to miss him, you know. So he kept me going to meetings for a few years there until he, you know, got older and moved away and blah, blah, blah. But um, still today, I uh, do remember that and um, am grateful to be able to um, drive newcomers and old timers to meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous. And um, my first sponsor was real big, you know, like in in, um, in Bill's story, he talks about how, is it in Bill's story or is it in Doctor's Opinion? Bill, anyway, Dr. Silkworth told Bill, uh, when Bill was whining about how nobody was staying sober, Dr. Silkworth said, stress the, the malady, stress the disease aspect of it. So my original sponsor um, was big on the allergy and the obsession, which of course I tried to get a pass on the allergy, but um, she always said that it, it's as if, like if you had um, pneumonia or something, you might go to the doctor and they'd give you an injection of penicillin and then they'd send you home with pills for 30 days. She said, you know, we're in AA, we tell people that it's a really good idea to go to a meeting every day for at least 90 days. That's sort of like the injection. And then you go to at least three meetings a week for forever. <laughs> After that, only, of course, we just say one day at a time. But um, yeah, she was she was big on the on the physical allergy and the mental obsession. And she would say things like, you know, it's the, the things that the book says about it. it's not a disgrace, it's a disease. And um, she would say, you know, if you had cancer or if you had diabetes and you had to, all you had to do to get some relief from your disease was put your butt in a chair for an hour every day, wouldn't you probably be willing to do that? And, um, you know, it's kind of hard, hard to argue with that logic. Although the meetings were 90 minutes in those days. This is a 90 minute meeting? Okay, an hour, cool. Um, <laughs> Anyways, um, I am incredibly grateful to be a sober member of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I am grateful for the old timers that said things like there's no wrong way to do the right thing. Um, I, uh, as I said, I had a lot of trouble following directions. So in my first very long, my first year of recovery was 20 months long. But in that first year, I changed jobs three times. I changed primary relationships. I moved, you know never been able to follow directions, but I am still here. I, um, it's not always been graceful. Um, it hasn't always been joyful. Uh, there, I don't know, there was, we were just talking about this in my home group last night, but it, something that somebody said reminded me, oh, I know, as somebody that's, that has three and a half years was saying that she had had this stretch that she just didn't want to go to AA anymore. And I didn't, for some reason, I always knew that I just had to go to AA. I knew I didn't want to drink and I had to go to AA, but there was a stretch of a few years. I don't know. I think it was like maybe between 10 and 14 or something like that, that I really didn't love AA and I wasn't really, I, you know, I would just go, but I would 
just go, you know, to the meeting. And I wasn't really connected. I mean, I had my little core group of people that I was connected with, and maybe I was sponsoring one or two people, but I was just not really connected. And today, I am very grateful to, um, like Lorraine said, I'm a member in good standing of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I have learned to never say no to an AA request, so thank you, Audrey. And um, I, it is my great gift. Somebody asked me recently, um, I'm trying to help somebody that, uh, in the first couple times that we talked, she told me that she had been to Hazelden and Betty Ford. And, you know, I'm thinking, you've been to Hazelden, you've been to Betty Ford, and now you're coming to Blaine. <laughs> what an order, right? And the next day, she goes, full disclosure, I've been to Hazelden three times. And I'm like, wow, you know? Um, and I don't know what I was going to say after this. I just lost my train of thought. Uh, I apologize. You, you better erase this. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm usually more more cohesive, I think. But um, oh, I know. I was just I was just trying to help her uh, be encouraged to not give up on herself and to and to come to meetings and not you know like we've all had our dark moments, you know, or maybe not all, but most of us have moments that we don't really know that, you know, we get a little tired of Alcoholics Anonymous or whatever, you know, a lot of us uh, get in those places where we're the one that's opening the hall and, you know, just sort of doing all the dirty work, the background work, which is the best work. Now, today, I know that's the best work, but, you know, sometimes it, it feels like a weight to people just thought of something else I wanted to say, and I can't think what it was. Oh my goodness, this is bad. Um, I read a few days ago that um, a wonderful woman, uh, Mildred F., had written a bunch of stuff, but the end of it was that working these 12 steps wakes up our spirit. And this gal that's been to all the treatment centers, she has a problem with the spirituality of the program, which she only sees as God. And I was trying, I was using that, what Mildred said about, it wakes up our spirit. I mean, isn't that a simpler way to say spiritual awakening? Oh my goodness, you know? And the 12 steps says, having had a spiritual awakening as the result of these steps, then we try to carry this message. And so those steps are just so amazing and magical. And um, it is a great gift when we have the privilege of helping somebody come in and go, yeah, yeah, this, this might work. This makes sense. And I am so amazed at how much smarter people are today. I think the young people are so much more open to like they're not as they're like not as afraid as i was because because i had the pitiful four horsemen and the, the, oh my goodness the the bedevilments oh my god all those all those things were just were just running my life alcohol it's really hard to stay drunk that's another person that i'm working with right now is that, like planning your next drink alcohol was totally running my life that's what i did I, you know, one of our old timers used to say that um, when we get here, we are, uh, we think we're having fun. I thought I was having fun. And uh, we, we, that's our first priority in life is getting high. And our second priority is, is supporting that high. And sometimes it, some of us keep jobs, others do other things, but some of us keep jobs. And then it's our family that's our third priority and our spiritual life we we got no idea even what that is and then when we come into alcoholics anonymous by the process of working these steps it completely turns around so that our spiritual life is number one our family is two our job is three because it's how we support our family and that fun stuff that's definitely four except for the part of fun that we have in here you know and it's like a, it's like a complete metamorphosis, but um, 
I am so glad I don't have to live that way anymore, that uh, it was a lot of work to try to, to keep the plates spinning and to keep people from knowing. And there was all that fear. And um, this is just a way better life. And I'm done. <laughs>